this great movement of bringing back our faithful, uh, those that we have lost along the way, and bring anyone and everyone who is interested in the beauty of the one holy apostolic uh, church, the Orthodox Church. Um, these sessions, as we are moving through uh, each week, this being the second session, uh, these sessions are being recorded with the permission of the presenters. <clears throat> Accordingly, uh, they will be released on our YouTube channel uh, this year in August 2020. So please stay tuned uh, to our social media accounts, uh, along with our website once that information is released. Uh, before I <clears throat> go in and formally introduce our speaker and presenter <clears throat> for today, I was just hoping that all of us would just pause for a moment, uh, gather our minds, our thoughts, and our intellects um, as we say a word of prayer. The prayers that we are offering is, uh, from, for today is the prayer from the Midnight Prayers of Monday uh, from what we call the Shimon Namaskarim. Um, so let us bow our heads, uh, just pause for a moment, close your eyes, and see the Lord God, the crucified and risen Messiah, uh, who's enthroned in our hearts, and let's commune with him um, this hour and this moment. Let us pray. O Lord, who dwells in the souls of those who fear him, to the one worshipful Son who abides in the bones of his saints, to the one Holy Spirit who weaves crowns of glory for his athletes. When we desire to offer your praises to the prophets, the apostles, and martyrs and confessors, the doctors of the Orthodox faith, and exalt them with songs of the Holy Spirit, because of the weakness of our speech and because of our mind is immersed in sin, we are not able to praise you and them as it is right and fitting. But since they have been made advocates and intercessors for us and have been given the authority over the treasury of their Lord, therefore, we also offer our prayers to them and address our supplications to them, that they may ask for us from our Lord God the pardon of offenses and the forgiveness of sins, and that they also may pray for the good rest and memorial <laughs> of all the faithful departed, and we will offer a praise and thanksgiving to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, both now and ever and in the ages of ages. Amen. We are gathered this evening. It's a joy for all of us to gather from our various locations. I know many of us are from Long Island. We also have a great number of people from uh, Texas, from uh, California, from Chicago, and uh, we welcome, on behalf of the faithful of St. Andrew's Mullingar Orthodox Mission, I welcome each and every one of you in the name of Christ, our Lord. We hope and we pray that once we're out of this craziness of this pandemic, that uh, we hope and pray you all will join us to worship uh, where we are located. Our temporary church home is located in Port Washington, New York. Feel free to follow us on, on Facebook. Twitter and Instagram, or our social media handle is that symbol, St. Andrews LI. And you can also visit us at St. Andrews uh, St. Andrews LI, rather, dot org. Um, <clears throat> today we're blessed. We're immensely blessed with the presence of uh, one of my brothers, uh, one of the first people I met at St. Econ Seminary. Um, his name, of course, is, as we all know, is Father Herman Clark. Father Herman Klar comes from a very unique background. Um, he, he was raised in the Old, old Order uh, Amish in Ashland County, Ohio. And his introduction to the Holy Orthodox faith began when some months from St. Gregory Palamas Orthodox Monastery uh, just showed up to the sawmill where his father worked in this Amish, Amish sawmill. And this very act of their visitation of these monks, this planted the small but powerful seeds of the Orthodox faith, um, not only in Father Herman, but his entire family, leading to their entire conversion. The entire family converted to the Orthodox faith. Um, as a result, their conversion also resulted in their pretty quick and immediate uh, excommunication from their Amish community. Uh, Father, uh, Father Herman and I, along with many other uh, brothers that graduated and studied at St. Econ Seminary, he graduated in uh, May 2009. He currently serves as the rector of Holy Assumption Orthodox Church, uh, located in a, 
the crazy bustling city of Lublin, Wisconsin. I'm being sarcastic. There's all of 100 people there, 120 people. Um, but Father Herman mm -hmm. is faithfully serving that church community. Mm -hmm. He also serves as a chaplain for the Air Force R Reserve. And I just learned, um, I was a little surprised seeing Father without a beard because I remember him with the beard. Um, <clears throat> he's also serving uh, the local uh, fire department at the, at the moment, and he just started um, just actively uh, serving his community. And we really commend that. And that's exactly how we remember um, Herman Clark back then, uh, now Father Herman uh, serving his community. He's married to a wonderful uh, young lady by the name of Erin. Um, uh, we call her in the Slavonic or the Eastern Orthodox tradition, the word for Kochema is Matushka. Um, but for our purposes, uh, she's Erin Kochema today. And, and uh, Father Herman Klar, you're uh, Herman Echen today. You're the first uh, um, first um, pseudo Malayali Echen we're calling uh, Herman Echen today. So we're, we're, really <laughs> happy. we're very happy to have you, Father Herman. And for all of us uh, to make the um, to listen to this uh, very easily, I, I guess, if you go scroll to your upper right-hand cor corner, there's a little button that says speaker view, and you could click on that and you can see um, Father Herman as he presents. So this way you don't get overwhelmed with seeing this many people um, on Zoom. Um, <clears throat> so Father Herman, <clears throat> thank you for, for being with us once again. Uh, we thank God that, you're, that you're being, you, know, you offered this much time away from your parish. Um, a church that used to be Catholic and now it's entirely Orthodox, which is another pretty cool we hope to hear about a little later on. So, Father, help us understand uh, the, this community of not only St. Andrew's Church, but many other people. Um, how did you and your family come to the Orthodox faith? Good evening, uh, Dennis Achen, or Daniel Achen, uh, and everyone. <clears throat> It's a pleasure to be with you uh, during this Paschal season in the year 2020. I know it's been a trial for uh, many people, uh, even for us here in the middle of nowhere, uh, Wisconsin. Um, <clears throat> our, our journey to the Orthodox uh, Church for, for my family began when I was still a child. I was uh, fairly young when uh, we my dad and my brothers and I became Orthodox, and that was in the early 90s. Uh, I believe I was what, uh, eight or nine years old when we were baptized at St. Gregory Palamas Monastery. Um, now, my father, he actually was born and raised Roman Catholic, and he ran away from, the, uh, from home when he was 13 years old and joined the Amish community. And that was, there's a lot in that as well, but that's not all very important right now in the overall journey to the Orthodox Church. Uh, but he ended up staying with the, in the Amish community and uh, married an Amish bishop's daughter, had several children. And uh, <clears throat> then one day, as uh, Dennis Action said, these monks showed up at the sawmill where he was working. And it was really odd for us to see these men wearing these long black dresses and these funny hats that had no brim on them. Um, but we knew they were men because they had beards. <laughs> so uh, that, was, that was something that was very familiar immediately for us children was they had beards. So that was perfectly fine. Uh, my dad still tells me periodically that when we were little children, whenever we went to town, if we saw a man without a beard, we didn't trust him because he didn't have a beard. Most, almost every Amish man has a beard. You know, some scraggly looking, some full, long, varying beards, but they all grow their beards. Um, so if they, they had a beard, so we could trust them. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, they were looking for someone to make benches and chairs and stuff for the monastery. And my father agreed to do that. And that was his in into getting into the uh, Orthodox world. And so he started asking them questions. He'd always been curious. Uh, and he, he would ask questions among the Amish. And you know, he, there were two typical responses that he got. Uh, one was either, I don't know, that's the way we've always done it, or don't ask questions. And those were, those were the two main responses he seemed to get when he asked questions uh, from the Amish about, why do we do things this way? Why, why don't we do it that way? Or, you know, why do we wear 
four buttons on our shirt and instead of full button all the way down. I don't know, it's the way we've always done it. Or don't ask questions. They didn't really encourage asking questions, especially about theology. Um, so when my dad met these monks and started uh, doing some work for them at the monastery, he very quickly started asking them questions and they started answering his questions and they were very happy to talk to him, uh, gave him some books to read. Um, and at some point along the way, and I, I don't know where this fell in the timeline, um, uh, Dennis Achen, you might remember Father Daniel Donlick from seminary. Um, he was involved at some point along the way. Uh, my father wrote some letters to him and he wrote back with some recommendations and things like that. But uh, yeah, like I said, I was fairly young and I don't know where that fell in the timeline. Um, but eventually, you know, the more that my father read, the more interested he became in it. Uh, because he was very, very interested in finding out about uh, um, the church pre-Protestant uh, uh, Reformation. And he started looking into Catholicism, but he was, it, all he could find was post-Vatican uh, one and two Catholicism. And he was not very satisfied with post-Vatican Catholicism. And he had done some research into a number of Protestant um, denominations, but it, like, he wanted to know what happened before the Reformation. And even in his uh, Protestant research, there was nothing there pre-Reformation, really. There are others, Jesus, the apostles, and then 1,500 years, and you've got the Reformation. In those 1,500 years, a lot of bad things happened. We don't really talk about that. Uh, we just move on. And now we've got the Reformation, and everything got better all of a sudden. But he wanted to know, he was always interested in history. So when he, when he met the Orthodox monks, and you know, as we know, the Orthodox Church goes all the way back. There's no break there. Uh, and so they could tell him a lot about the history. And so he did a lot of reading into history and became convinced this is what he wanted to become. He wanted to become an Orthodox Christian. Uh, and he did call the monastery one day, he went to the neighbor's house, the English neighbor's house uh, to use a telephone to call the monastery one day with a question that he had. And the monk who answered the phone said, well, are you gonna be busy today? Our bishop is here. We told him about you and he would like to meet you. So, you know, if you're available, he'll come up to meet with you. And my dad said, sure, that's fine. So uh, Metropolitan Maximus came up from the monastery to meet with my father and I can't remember the exact amount of time, but it was pretty much all day. It was a long day. I still have uh, memories of the monk that drove him up uh, playing with me and my brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, I can picture him running around, wearing his cassock, his long beard, and he's running around at our house with us chasing after him. Um, so that was kind of you know the thing that really brought my father over the hump into like definite, very definitively, this is what I want to be. Uh, I want to be Orthodox. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, as I mentioned a little bit ago, my, he married an Amish bishop's daughter. So that was uh, a little bit harder for my mother. Um, you know, her father being a bishop, and we, at the time we were living in the community with my in-laws right around that, or my, not my in-laws, my, my dad's in-laws, the Amish bishop living right around the corner. Um, and so that was quite difficult for her. So my dad and my brothers and I were baptized at the monastery and my mom and my sisters did not become Orthodox at that point. Uh, so this, we still lived in the Amish community for a short period of time after that. Um, but you know, again, it's, it's hard to keep secrets in very close knit communities and they found out fairly soon. So <clears throat> we ended up moving to Youngstown, Ohio into a real city this time. Um, and there we started attending uh, an Orthodox church. Um, I think it was St. Mark's Orthodox Church, and the priest there, uh, Father Daniel Rohan, a wonderful man, he would, and you know, at this point, my father's still not driving yet, so we have no way of getting to church, no way of getting anywhere, really. Father Daniel Rohan would come pick us up every, more, every Sunday morning, come pick us up, go to church, then he'd do his brusque media, and then prepare for liturgy and everything, and my brothers and I, we would play, my dad would help uh, him get ready, and then uh, after liturgy, he would take us, after liturgy and coffee hour, he would take us back home. Um, and then we finally found a, a church, my, my dad finally started driving. We found a church a little closer 
and uh, we started attending that uh, Orthodox church. And then uh, eventually my mom and my sisters were chrismated Orthodox as well. They uh, joined the Orthodox church. So we're all, the whole family became Orthodox. Um, <clears throat> Oh, and Father, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. So what was the turning point for your mother and sisters? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. And my sisters were young, so they just did that because that's what the family did. It, it kind, of, kind of like the biblical, biblical accounts of so-and-so and all their household were baptized. So the children sure. were part of the household and became Orthodox. Um, it was just two separate portions of the household. Uh, but, you know, I've never really um, asked about that. I, part of it was, you know, keeping the family together in, in one faith and also, you know, physically, physically together because there, there, was, uh, um, there was a lot of tension. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, there were some, some of the Amish uh, people were trying to convince my mother to leave my father at uh, various points in time. Um, so that ca caused a lot of tension. And, you know, my father is not perfect either. So, uh, and neither is my mother. Uh, you know, I'm the closest in the family to being perfect. You, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the hair looks good tonight, so I had to say it. Um, <clears throat> um, but anyway, I, I'm nowhere close to being perfect. <laughs> so, you know, th there was tension and those, um, um, interferences, if you will, uh, from the Amish were definitely not helpful. And so there was a lot of tension. But after, so it was in 92, I believe, when my father's and I, my father and brothers and I became Orthodox in 1995, almost three years later, when my mom and sisters became Orthodox. Uh, so it did take some time. Um, so we've been Orthodox since then. Um, it's it, ha it hasn't been easy uh, in all those years since then, even because there's still, you know, things that come up from the past and that, uh, um, but the thing we have now is we have the true church to kind of lean on, uh, you know, like the, um, the, the mother hen protecting us, if you will. And you know, we still have issues like everyone else um, <clears throat> in our family. Um, but the church is not one of those issues. The church is a thing that has kind of held us up along the way. Um, you know, and like many families, you know, the kids grow up and some of them don't stay in the church. Uh, one of my sisters and uh, both of my brothers, well, one of my brothers attends once in a while, but my other brother, so I have two brothers, two sisters. Uh, so one sister attends church regularly uh, out in uh, Maryland, um, and then I, my younger younger brother and the older of my two sisters do not attend an Orthodox church at all, really. So it's like I said, we're not perfect. We have our struggles as well. And growing, when they grew up, they made a decision to kind of jump away. Um, but the thing that really brought my father in, which began the process for the whole family, was the history, learning the history of the church, learning what the church did, what the church taught, what the fathers of the church taught, what the apostles taught, and finding out that there was a church that continues that tradition that was passed on by Christ and by the apostles. So that was what initially brought us in. And <clears throat> yeah, I will say one of the things that... Um, kept me in was the beauty of the services. Uh, you know, I remember the, uh, one of the monks at St. Gregory Palamas Monastery, uh, you know, we're sitting in church and I always loved, you know, I watched the chanters, I watched the iconostas, I watched what the priest is doing. It was all, I, I liked it. I, I, I love the beauty of it, the beauty of the church, the beauty of the services, the beauty of the singing. Um, but I, I do remember one time, um, Oh, I forget, I forget this monk's name now, a wonderful man. Um, but he came up to me afterwards, and I had apparently fallen asleep. I just kind of conked out. My head fell back in my, on the pew, and uh, he, he came up to me afterwards. And, you know, it was such a wonderful service. It puts you right to sleep. Uh, I must have been really tired, but I was also young. So, <laughs> um, But like I said, the, the beauty of the, of the Orthodox services, are, it's, it's just 
wonderful. It's one of the things that has kept me in the church all these years and has um, helped me develop a love for the church. Um, like I was young, like I said, when I came into the church, a young child, so I didn't really know much. I just accepted everything and I went through, I experienced everything. So I, I began with experiencing and not with reading anything. You know, a, lot, a lot of the, uh, um, the, the guys I went to seminary with, they converted because of things that they read. They converted as adults because they read and they researched and they figured out this was the true church that way. Um, I began with experiencing the church. And then when I came to seminary, that's when I really started doing all these in-depth reading. And, you know, I was still young then. I was uh, 18 when I went to seminary. So I wasn't the most mature seminarian there. Um, but it is, that's when I really began my, um, my main catechism, if you will, learning about the church more than I had all this experience behind me. And that's what that really caused me to truly love the church was experiencing the worship of the church. Well, Father Herman, can I, can I interject and just ask some question, you know, sure. um, just, 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 um, just a way of information for our, our, our listeners and those who are present, the word you use prosca media. Uh, just for everyone's information, that word is similar to our tradition we say tuyobo. Um, it's the preparatory prayers mm -hmm. that the priest offers before the celebration <laughs> of Holy Kurban in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Just as a point of clarification for, for everyone. But Father Herman, um, you know, I, yeah. I did have a question for you. Your, your story is absolutely yeah. fascinating. And especially in remembering from seminary, it's all the more um, vivifying, even just listening now. Um, you know, a lot of us, many of us who are in the Northeast United States, we drive through a place called Lancaster, Pennsylvania. There's a, a beautiful like uh, theater called Sight and Sounds. And mm -hmm. uh, we always drive through Amish country, even my home parish, we always stop by after um, the show, we always go and get Amish food. Yeah. We have either lunch or dinner with, with the Amish folk. But aside from, as you uh, very much alluded to, um, aside from knowing that we, that the Amish folk, they're very traditional, they don't drive cars, use electricity, they have long beards without a mustache, the, the long brimmed hat kind of a thing. But what is the, exactly, but what is the faith of the Amish people? Like, are they Christian? Are they not so Christian? Are they pseudo-Catholics? Um, you know, pseudo-Orthodox with the beards? Or what are they? Can you share with all of us, Father? <laughs> Um, well, they are definitely not pseudo-Catholic. They, they, they fall into the Protestant category. Um, they are uh, descendants of the original Anabaptists. And uh, Anabaptist just means rebaptize. So when the, the Reformation happened, the original reformers, like Luther, did not, uh, he still continued infant baptism. Uh, he continued believing that uh, uh, the, the Eucharist and the teachings of the Eucharist being the body and blood. Um, but then, you know, after a little bit of time, there were uh, additional reformers who disagreed with, um, <clears throat> with, with uh, Luther and Swingley and Calvin and said, you know, you guys are not taking this far enough. And Jacob Amon was one of those who felt that the original reformers didn't go far enough in their reforms. And so he initiated more reforms, including um, uh, you know, articles regarding clothing, uh, with how you wear your clothing, with hair, with head coverings. He, he was a lot more strict than the others. Um, <clears throat> so the Amish get their name from Jacob Amon. So you know, today, the you know, since they are descendants, as I said, of Anabaptists, they're not Anabaptists anymore because they don't rebaptize. It was only the original group that could be technically considered Anabaptists because they were baptized as infants, then baptized again as adults because they uh, felt they needed to have what I heard in many Protestant churches, believers' baptism. Um, so they are Christian. They fall under the Protestant category, and they are they do have some similarities uh, to the Orthodox Church. Um, as you may know, a lot of the uh, Slavic countries celebrate Nativity, Christmas, on the, uh, what is the Julian calendar, on, which is for us is January 6th. 
or um, seventh, sorry. Um, so they, the Amish celebrate according to the, some of these services according to the, uh, the Julian calendar. So they celebrate Christmas on January 7th with, with many of the Orthodox countries throughout the world. Um, and as you mentioned, they also have the beards so they would fit in well. Uh, yeah, another way that they fit in well with the uh, um, Orthodox world is they hold fast to traditions. The thing, you know, when it comes to tradition, though, the thing that separates them from the Orthodox Church is that their tradition and their faith are intertwined very strongly to the extent that they will, uh, there are Amish groups that will break communion with each other over how many buttons they're allowed to have on their shirts or what color shirts or socks that they're allowed to wear. So they're called, so they have tradition. They hold fast strongly to tradition, which can be a good thing. The Orthodox Church strongly believes in the tradition that has been passed down. It's through the tradition of the church that we know a, a lot of things that have been revealed by the Holy Spirit to the uh, fathers of the early church, uh, to the apostles and everything. So tradition is very important to us in the Orthodox Church. However, you know, the cultural tradition is what uh, is so strongly intertwined with their Amish faith that it dictates a lot of things about the faith as well. So there, you know, the tradition is good, but when you're the culture, uh, sorry, I should differentiate between culture and tradition. They, the, the culture is part of their tradition that they hold on to, but the culture also dictates a lot of uh, religious aspects, a lot of religious rules. Um, so then that's where they start differing again. Um, but faith-wise, they're Christians, and they have some similarities to the Orthodox world, uh, and they have some similarities to the Catholic world, too, if you look deep enough. Uh, but for the most part, they, they're they're Protestant. They, they fall under the uh, Protestant umbrella. Gotcha. So, so Father, let me ask you, when you're, you speak about all these traditions, typically, as you were starting to say, forgive me for interrupting, but, you know, we learn a lot of these traditions, even uh, big T, small T, as we would refer to it. Um, we learn a lot of these things in seminary, you know, whether about the, the liturgical tradition, how we dress, how we do things, etc. So is there any sort of, like, um, seminary for Amish people, like you, you mentioned your gri grandfather, he was a bishop uh, uh, of the Amish community. So, did he was he trained in a particular way? And you guys speak and hold scripture highly, from what I imagine. So, was there any yes. specific methodology in learning scripture as an elder of your community, of the Amish community rather? Now, now that I, I can't speak very much to that, um, because I was fairly young, as I said, when we became Orthodox. Um, there is, I don't know much about that aspect of it, how it becomes that, um, th there is no, there is no seminary. They, <clears throat> so they, they do have a, I guess it, it's considered a hierarchical structure, um, similar to what maybe some Protestants have, though they, they would call it, they have a bishop and then they have, um, they call them preachers. Uh, and they don't even call them ministers, they call them preachers. And then they also have uh, a diaconate, which is a wonderful thing. Their diaconate is uh, very similar to what the diaconate was in the early church. The, the um, deacons are in charge of ministering to people who are in need. They are also the ones who do the catechism, like during the, um, uh, what they call um, grosme, uh, high church. That's the, uh, the, uh, the the service where they have communion. At a portion of that service, the deacon will take the young people out, the one the ones who are old enough to be close to being baptized. So they baptize mid late teens. So the mid late teens, as they're getting close to their baptism, the deacon will take them out, and they'll go to a separate room or a separate building, and they will be working on uh, catechism. So that is the deacon's main role. But then you have the, uh, um, the the preachers, and as the name implies, they preach. That is their main job is preaching. Um, and again, th there may there may be more entailed in each of those roles, but I am uh, not very familiar with that. 
Um, but it is very much based on knowledge of scripture in, uh, um, in if, not, they're not really elected, they're kind of nominated, if you will, to become a, uh, a preacher or a deacon, but you do have to have a good knowledge of scripture. And then you also have to, <clears throat> as St. Paul says in his epistles, righteous living. You know, there are a number, a couple of sections where he talks about how the um, elders and leaders of the church should live. And so that, that is an aspect of it. You know, maintain a good household, um, which I sometimes find difficult with, uh, with three children uh, and not being very organized myself. Um, but th so they have to maintain a righteous lifestyle, I mean, to the best of their ability, but they have to be, you know, try to, st they have to stick out a little bit more above the rest and have that knowledge of scripture. So uh, scripture plays highly in their, uh, in their faith. It's very much like the Protestants. It's uh, pretty much sola scriptura, uh, only scriptures. So the scriptures are very highly, or very strongly intertwined in everything. So a, a, a good, strong working knowledge of the scriptures is uh, a big thing in um, electing a new uh, preacher or deacon or bishop. So, so, fa so, Father, here you are from, from a young age to the age of 10. You're raised in this, in this community. Um, and those are the years are very formative years for any child, as you very well know, as, as a father of three. Um, so my, my question is, was it difficult for you or even any of your loved ones, your siblings, your parents, was there any aspect of the Orthodox faith that you're raised a certain way, you know, you're used to just hearing, I would imagine, in my mindset, a man standing in front and preaching, and that's it. But in the Orthodox Church, you have, I think as Father Kirill mentioned last week, you have the, the smells and bells. Um, it's a very, mm -hmm. it's like a total 180 kind of a thing. It's, a, it's a absolute, very different. So was there any aspect of the Orthodox faith, um, in the faith or praxis even, the practice, that you all, or for you specifically, you found difficult to accept or embrace? And, and if so, how did you overcome that? Well, for, for me personally, there was nothing really difficult. Uh, because I was so young, that was definitely a benefit um, coming in. And I, I didn't really have much of a struggle. I didn't have any struggle with any aspect of it. Uh, venerating icons, I, I had no problem with it. I was a child, and, you know, children love to do – children – one of the uh, – um, one of the good things about the Orthodox Church is it incorporates all your senses. Um, and as, as all of us who have children know, children love incorporating their senses in everything. So we, hearing the music, smelling the, uh, the incense, um, and thankfully it was good incense too from the very beginning. So <laughs> that wasn't a turnoff. I know I, I've used some incense uh, personally, that didn't smell so great, and they're like, oh, man. Um, so there is incense out there that's not the best. Um, but the, the smell of the incense and you know, learning how to make the sign of the cross and to go up to venerate the icons, I, I had no struggle with that. I just, okay, do this. Okay, I do this. Kiss that icon. Okay, I kiss the icon. Um, so I, I had no struggle with that. I do know that... Um, uh, my, my mom especially had um, some reservations, some, some struggle with things. And um, to my shame, I have never really spoken to her about it. You know, it's not, I've never thought of asking her um, about her journey and how it affected her becoming Orthodox and the things that may have maybe held her up. Um, I do, I, I, as I, briefly intimated earlier and that I do I do know that there was a lot of um, interpersonal issues that uh, caused some problems um, and to this day though my mom still wears her Amish clothes so that was actually one of the benefits you know when you become orthodox you don't have to change your culture you know, the, if you look at the history of the orthodox church the Orthodox Church does not go and change the culture. The, the Orthodox Church comes in, and anything good 
it's fine to stay. You keep what is good. You don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. You keep what is good. Um, and so the Orthodox Church has historically come in and translated things into the language of the people that they're ministering to. Uh, and they have translated the scriptures, the services, and everything else. And they have incorporated whatever is useful in the culture into learning tools and things like that. So <clears throat> that was one of the benefits is that she didn't have to change her culture. She could keep her Amish dress. She could keep her cap on and everything. So she still looks Amish today. And this is uh, so, so, uh, 27. I'm curious, I'm curious, Father, about one thing. You know, you, you say all this, uh, which is amazing. What? But I, and a lot of our viewers are also um, wondering, was it difficult for you all as a family? You're used to no electricity, no driving and all this. And it, it, I would imagine a culture shock. Like, how was that adjusting to that? Uh, that, that was a bit of a culture shock, yes. Um, early on, and I, this may have even been right before we became Orthodox. I, Again, you know, I was a little kid. I didn't care about the timeline. It didn't matter all that much. Uh, but at one point, very early on, we went to, um, uh, what was the name of the monastery? In Elwood City, Holy Transfiguration uh, Women's Monastery in Elwood City. Yes. We went there for a visit. We stayed in the guest house. And um, uh, Mother, Mother Christophora, who is the current abbess there, she was at the monastery there in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, whenever it was when we visited. Uh, she was a nun there, and I um, spoke to her one of the times she came to a seminary during my time there. She came and she did a, uh, a talk on something. I can't remember what, you know, my too much stuff to try to remember, and my brain is not very good to start with. Um, so I, I went up to her and uh, introduced myself, and she says, oh, I, I, I remember you. I remember when you were a little, a little child who came to the mo uh, monastery to visit, and she remembers us as children flipping the light switch up and down because the light goes on, the light goes off, light goes on, light goes off. That was so cool. Um, so, I, I mean, it was definitely a big cultural change. Um, I couldn't exactly call it a shock. It went, well, maybe, yeah, we were in awe. It's like, oh, let there be light. It was like, you know, it was a, just a small God moment. Let there be light and instantly there's light. Um, but... Yeah, so, so there was a lot of getting used to uh, uh, these new cultural things. Uh, again, for us children, not very difficult. You know, we, uh, when we first, uh, we, we did encounter TV before becoming Orthodox. Because we went to visit, uh, as I uh, said, my dad was born Roman Catholic and then joined the Amish church before becoming Orthodox. Um, so we, when we went to visit my uh, Catholic grandparents, they had a TV. So we did encounter TV um, and we watched the John Wayne movie or something. And I remember my sister uh, screaming and running from the room when one of the bad guys held a gun up and pointed it towards the camera. And we know what guns are. The Amish have guns. They go, they go hunting and uh, whatnot. And she jumped up, screamed, ran from the room. Um, but uh, so we got used to TV fairly quickly. You know, we like TV like all other kids did once we got one. Um, oh, Father, one of, one of the comments I just got, I, I just have to share with you and every and all our listeners. So Father Herman found the light, Christ, and the light that's sitting on the ceiling. So it's pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty exciting, you know? <laughs> so Father, as we're honoring the time and looking and receiving a lot of questions, just, to, um, uh, just a few questions to you um, in your experience, Father. You know, can, can you touch upon just briefly... Um, you, you know, you mentioned, uh, to, to me at least, you were banished, or as the description for you in our, in our, the series for our flyer, that the flyer says about our series, rather, um, you were banished from the Amish community. Um, so how is that for all of you? Because your grandfather is a bishop of the Amish community. So do you keep in touch with them? Like, well, well how is all that for you all? Well, that, that is probably one of the most difficult things for my mother um, because we were excommunicated. Um, so we, we are allowed to go visit and we, we did visit frequently. Uh, both of my Amish grandparents, um, have reposed. 
my my grandfather was in 2000 and well the years don't matter uh it's completely beside the point but we would go visit for, uh, as often as we could um but one of the things that um saint paul says in one of his epistles and i am paraphrasing here not to eat with sinners and they take that very literally so you know when i look at it from an orthodox perspective i think i can see not to commune with sinners not to share communion with those who do not believe the same things those who do not share the faith um, but for the amish they take that very literally and so they will not eat they will not sit down and at the same table and eat with those who have left the Amish church, which is one of the greatest sins, is to leave the faith, leave the church. Um, so when we go visit, you know, there was a couple of times where we would go visit uh, my grandparents and my grandmother and my aunt were baking cookies, but they never offered us any cookies. And I remember her being puzzled puzzled by this like what why why can't we have any cookies i mean if we were thirsty we could go get a drink of water because you know they've got this old pump where you pump and you hold the cup there and you get your water um so we we, we could get a drink but th they never shared any food with us uh and many of our relatives when we went to visit that's how that was when you're excommunicated there you know you you can still come for visits but you cannot share in the life of an Amish person really so we so a couple, does, a that couple still, of does that still sting does that sting for all of you like I would imagine you grew up in your formative years as a young person you can't see any of your friends you played played with uh, is wow it's it's today it's frustrating it's frustrating yeah. because it's um it's 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 I guess at, at best, it's a misinterpretation of scripture. Um, so it's, it's frustrating for me. Like, open your mind just a little bit and think about that. Think about that. If, if you truly believe that you are um, that you are the true church, which I mean, most Protestant denominations, the Roman Catholic Church, everybody, everybody has claims to be the true church. Um, and I'm not going to get into that uh, aspect of it really, but if you, if you claim you are the Church of Christ, would Christ really kick them? What did Christ, how did Christ treat the sinners? He tried to get them to repent and convert, but by kicking them out of the life of the community, I don't see that as a good way of instilling repentance in a person. So it's... It's unfortunate. I, I find it frustrating. I'm still looking at, for ways to uh, to deal with that and to maybe get past that, to cope with that, and to maybe help other people who might be in the same situation. So, but yeah, it's frustrating. But as as one of our parishioners says, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. But Father, we promise you. I can say I speak on behalf of everyone at St. Andrews. You ever come to St. Andrews, we'll give you all the cookies you want. <laughs> well, thank you, <laughs> Father. Father, what do, what is it that you love about the Orthodox faith? Like, like I shared with you as we introduced and spoke about it, it's not very often we hear of anyone, especially for Malankara Orthodox Christians, mm -hmm. joining the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church, an ancient church established by Saint Thomas, the disciple of Jesus Christ himself. So, you know, in your experience, like today, what do you love? What is the one thing you love? about the Orthodox Christian faith? Well, I touched on that a, a bit already, the services. I, I love the services. And then um, one of the parishes that we went to, uh, instead of serving in the altar as an altar boy, the choir director roped us into the choir. And then I really got into singing. And that continued when I went to seminary. So just the beauty of the services, the hymnography, I, I, I love the hymns of the church, uh, especially during this Paschal season. Uh, I love the hymns during Pascha. Um, and then actually now as a priest standing in front of the altar and doing those services, uh, offering the divine liturgy is just, it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. So th those are the, that's just what kind of well, keeps Well, one of my fondest, one of my fondest memories, Father, from seminary is in the monastery church for Pascha and watching you and Father John Diamantis 
pelting the Pascal Treparian out like I've never seen anyone uh, scream it out and it was with such a joy. So it was very evident for me in, in what you just shared. But so, so just piggybacking off of that, Father, so today in this very moment, uh, why do you have such conviction? And this is all for all of us because many of us who are here on this, on this uh, little virtual church gathering, many of us have a strong conviction for the Orthodox faith. Some of us are unsure. Some of us are still, you know, we're, we're still, you know, treading the waters, we're uncertain. Why do you, Father Herman, why do you have such conviction that this is the true faith and this is the true church? That, you know, I, I've been thinking about that and it's, it's, it's difficult to really put it into words, but it, it's, it is what feels the most right. Not, 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 just, not just the most right, it is what feels right. It is what feels correct. Um, you know, as you mentioned at the very beginning in the introduction, I am an Air Force Reserve chaplain now, and that I just recently reappointed as a chaplain. But I also spent uh, six years in the reserves as a chaplain's assistant. And one of the jobs of the chaplain's assistant is to set up for the services, to run lights and sound for services. So I have been, I have, seen a number of different Protestant denominations doing their services. I have seen, you know, and I've been to a lot of Roman Catholic services. I've been to mass a number of, I know what mass is like. Um, and the, in the ortho, and I've talked to people about theology, uh, but the Orthodox Church is the only one that has ever really felt right. It is, it feels true. It is the truth. And, you know, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it, so, like I said, it's difficult to put it all into words, but it, it just, it feels right. This is a place that brings life. This is a church that brings life. This is the truth. So, and the truth is Christ. So, it's a feeling, I guess. And it, it's, it's a feeling that overwhelms and overpowers more than like the feeling of happiness or sadness or anything. So, it's, is something that's very deep down, you know, coming from the soul that, that's telling me this is the truth. This is the true faith. This is the true church. And it, and it kind of it, it piggybacks off the previous, the, the previous question about the beauty, the services, the hymnography and everything else. And you look at the, when I, all these Protestant services that I've gone to, it's kind of dry. I mean, I don't mean to put them down or anything or to offend them, but it's kind of dry. It's it's part concert, part motivational speech, and it's not, it, it doesn't feel like worship to me. And in the Orthodox world, this is worship. This is worship of the one true God, and this is what I see as the truth. Well, it's funny you said it because I think Father Kirill was sharing last week about that. His experience is like you as a Protestant pastor himself. Mm -hmm. He was so busy prepping sermons and doing all that, spending an hour, 45 minutes preaching, whatever it might be. And he was saying when he entered the church, you know, this was in our conversation, he, he was just able just to stand and be and let God do the work. It was a, and, and unfortunately in the West, and in a lot of churches in the West, they have demystified the whole understanding of God. They have mm -hmm. made God something to put under a microscope. It's like a, it becomes a very, a brainy act. It's a, it's a something, a thought and principle. It's not, as you shared in your own experience in life, it's not experiential. Um, so uh, it's really amazing to hear your journey. Um, Father, what advice would you give to all of us who are still in the Orthodox faith, to those who are uncertain, and to even those who are probably still, who are just thinking of even leaving the church? What, what advice would you offer to them, Father? Yeah. Well, there's one thing that would fit into all those categories, those who are in the church, who are thinking of leaving, or thinking of joining, or thinking of leaving, and those who have left. And that's questions. Ask questions. Uh, you know, they're, they're, this is, questioning is how we learn. If we have a question about the church, if we have a question about God, it's okay to ask that. I know in, um, in some circles, Asking, questioning God, why would God do this? Why would God do that? Or, you know, 
why this, why asking any questions is just strongly discouraged because we can't question God. We can't question things from God. Um, but but if, if God is who we say he is, if God is the God that has been revealed to us from you know the new or the old testament into the new testament he can stand up to a few questions so you know if you're thinking especially for those who are thinking of leaving the church um i you know I, i'm in a clergy group on facebook and i've, I've seen a couple of stories of uh, parishioners who during this global pandemic have decided you know they know they know they no longer fit in with the orthodox church and for one of the stories that i read in particular just a couple of questions. Ask. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Because if you ask me a question, if I don't know the answer, you know, especially with questions about God, you know, theology, church related, if I don't know the answer, I will sure try to find out for you. I'm not going to put you down and say, oh, well, if I don't know the answer, it's not important. Well, that's not true. Because any question, no matter how trivial it may seem to the person in authority or in power or to the priest or to the bishop or whatever, it may seem trivial to me or it may seem trivial to the bishop or to someone who's been Orthodox their entire life, but to the person asking the question, it's not trivial. So it is okay to ask questions. And I encourage people to ask questions. If you have a question about the church, by all means, please ask the question and we will find an answer for you. So that's, that's the key thing right there. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I think also just to, you know, just echoing your words, it says the, the whole, your whole experience, you just knew when you walked into the church and even reflecting on our conversations, even outside of this Zoom meeting, um, even in seminary, I still remember walking into your room in the middle of the night. Yeah, if you, I think you and I were the only one on our floor that did papers at late night. And just walking into your room and just asking the question, like, why? Why did you joined the church. I still remember you just turning and just saying exactly what you said now. It just felt right. It was right. It was the right thing. There was something, there was a peace inside that made you have a conviction to say, this is the right thing. This is the right faith. Um, Father Herman, you know, this is an amazing story um, that you're sharing and we're all fascinated by this, especially your journey. And I thank you and thank God for you and the courage that you're sharing um, to, in sharing all this. Um, I'm just going to open it up. Um, we have quite a few questions okay. um, that, that are coming in, Father. Um, I, I'm trying to field them. So everyone, please send your questions. Uh, please forgive us if we're not able um, to address them. And we're just trying to honor the time, um, just as a reminder for all of us, um, because I, I know we have a lot of questions, and Father is busy, and we all are busy. Um, yeah. Father, how did you know you, I think you started off talking about seminary. Did, did your education in seminary, um, did it help you in your current uh, moment to decide that, you know, this with the conviction, did it help you strengthen your conviction that this is the faith? And, and another question to follow up on that, um, I think you mentioned your father is a priest, right, Father, Father Herman? He is, yes. Yes. So was it following his footsteps that you became, you chose to answer the call and becoming a priest or was it something else was as father alexander golubov would say did god pick up the phone and call you <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well you know it's quite possible that's what happened but that's not how i saw it at the time um uh, my, my dad was ordained in 1999 and i graduated high school in uh, 2001 um and then i i didn't go to college or anything i enlisted in the air force uh, uh as a chaplain's assistant and then i went to training for that came back home and went to work this was just a reserve so the one weekend a month two weeks a year deal and so i just started working and so my senior year in high school especially and then that the year that i had off before seminary my father did a lot of talking to me about going to seminary herman you know i think you should Go to seminary. You should consider seminary. You should you should consider becoming a priest. I think you have a calling to become a priest. Herman, have you thought about a seminary? And then uh, 2002, he went to the All American Council in Orlando, Florida, and uh, talked to then Father Michael, now Archbishop Michael of New York, New Jersey, for the OCA, and um, got an application for me. And you know, there's 
a lot more to that story of how I get, finally got into seminary, but it did involve a phone call because my application was late and I was late with everything. And I called uh, the seminary of Father Michael, I answered the phone and, um, you know, he had the words of, uh, was it um, Philip who said, come and see to Nathaniel. Um, mm -hmm. And he just said, just come on out. So I came to seminary. Uh, so it was a lot, it, going to seminary was, it, it felt like at the time, a lot of pressure from my father. But then again, I stayed for seven years and got my undergraduate degree and got my uh, master of divinity degree as well. And he didn't force me to stay for seven years. So I can't blame him uh, for that. I stayed there and I'm, th I'm thankful I did uh, because I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about the church and it really, a lot of those things that I learned in seminary that I learned about the church, the, the theology of the church, uh, just it, I don't know, what's the word, confirmed my, the convictions that I had or the things that I felt about the church. So mm -hmm. seminary taught me the words uh, of, for the feelings or the, not, not, not feelings as in emotions, but the, the inside. And it was able to, it was put into words then, if you will. Um, well, absolutely. I think if we lack the words, our beloved professor, Dr. David Ford, would give it to us. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be happy to. Sometimes so, so it's too. <laughs> but Father Herman, so, you know, here's a question that I think is really good. Besides the Bible, besides Holy Scripture, is there a book of or collection of writings that you find to be spiritually enriching for you? Well, <clears throat> what am I... What am I reading right now? I can't, I can't remember the name of the book right now. And, you know, to be quite honest, for a very long time, including all my time at seminary, reading nonfiction was very difficult. And, you know, because I, I love my fiction, the story. I love the story. And reading nonfiction was, it seemed dry, boring, you know, and, and it was difficult for me to read that. And then I, I actually, I, I read a book that my father-in-law recommended, non-theological, it was Seabiscuit. And I love the style of the author's writing. And uh, I read another one by the same author. And then I started reading, got, got back into reading a little bit more about, uh, back into the, theological books again. And I started well, like, oh, well, th th this is not as dry and boring as I remembered. So I needed more time to mature, if you will. Um, but <clears throat> when, uh, so I'm reading a book. It's about the, the history of um, the divine liturgy, how it developed, uh, how, you know, vestments developed. Um, I wish I could remember the name of it, but I, it's, it's been around for 30 some years and then just recently got republished. Uh, and it's, it's a very good book. And reading these things again now are, uh, uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, I, I love the beauty of the services and the beauty of the hymnography. Reading things, reading first something that I, about something that I love is helpful and also then leading into, you know, things that I need to read more as well. Um, so reading about the hymnography, reading about the services of the church. Uh, so if you have an interest in something in the church, start with that, develop that more, and then that can also uh, kind of leapfrog into other things in the church, reading more theology and things like that. So there isn't really any specific genre, if you will. I do love history, though. Gotcha. I love history. Church gotcha. and otherwise. Well, fa Father, aside from the Lord Jesus, um, is there a specific person, the Bible, or even among the saints, the, 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 of all the saints, uh, that really impact you the most? And um, how and why? Um, well, this, my, my patron saint, St. Herman of Alaska, um, and Herman is my given name. It's, it's not one that I took uh, becoming Orthodox either. Uh, so it was my name from birth. Uh, but St. Herman of Alaska, because of his life, uh, he was just a simple monk. He was never ordained, but he lived a life of service. He served and ministered to the native people of Alaska. He interceded on their behalf to the Russian-American Trading Company when they were mistreating the native workers. Um, 
But when there was a uh, plague that came through, what did he do? He went and he ministered to the sick and the dying and the orphans that remained. He built an orphanage for them. He built a school for them. He taught them how to garden, how to do uh, grow crops and all these other things. Um, so the, the life of St. Herman of Alaska, uh, I guess, it inspires me to try to become a better priest, to minister better to the people. So St. Herman. St. Herman, amazing. <clears throat> um, Father, is, you know, th there's another question. I think you already mentioned it, but do the history of the church and the incorruptibility of the liturgy play a factor in your conviction to the Orthodox Church as the true church? Uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's a difficult question to answer with words. Mm. So, I'm not in my head. <laughs> um, sorry. No, yeah, in, in a sense, yes. In a sense, mm. yes. Because it's the, um, I, I, as I mentioned very briefly, uh, th there's a huge difference between Orthodox worship, Protestant worship, and especially now post Vatican II Catholicism. Uh, if you listen closely to the Roman Catholic Mass, you will hear certain things that are uh, um, also said in the Divine Liturgy. But just the way the Mass is done is just completely different. <clears throat> and so going to an Orthodox liturgy, uh, especially, you know, once I began participating, serving in the altar, uh, then singing, and now as a priest, it just, the, the worship in the Orthodox Church is what... It feels right. It feels like this is this is the true worship. Um, and, you know, you can research all you want. You know, there are a number of Protestant denominations who are trying to re recreate biblical worship, how they did it in the New Testament. Um, and, well, they're always looking at times where the Christians were persecuted where they couldn't meet openly. Uh, and so this book that I'm reading, and I I'm not gonna take the time to run grab it because I'm not 100% sure where it is, but he, in that book, they cover that, the, the early worship. Now it was modeled off of synagogue worship and how the church today, to a certain extent, is still based off of that original synagogue worship. And so then, you know, you've got uh, um, these, uh, uh, oh, what are the, the uh, the Father uh, Gilquist group, I can't remember their, their name. Pentecostal Protestant Church. Yes. So they... Orthodox, rather. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's how they began their journey to the Orthodox Church, is researching the original worship. And they created a form of worship that was very similar to the Orthodox worship. And then that's what brought them in. So definitely, yes, worship is a uh, huge thing there. Father, was there any particular reason, and this is the last question, just honoring the time, um, was there any particular reason that your family, maybe your father would be able to, has shared this with you, um, to leaving, uh, deciding to leave the Amish community for the Orthodox um, Church? Was it due to theological disagreements to the view of the, or, or anything of that sort, or you know, the view of God? Is there any particular reason why you came to the Orthodox Church? Well, once we became Orthodox, it was difficult to remain in the Amish community. Once, or once they found out that we became Orthodox, it would have been extremely difficult to remain in the Amish community because just trying to do anything in the community would have been very difficult because they, don't, they won't have any business dealings. Um, and even today, you know, we, when we moved to Wisconsin, we didn't buy a house right away. Uh, when, we, when I was assigned to the Holy Assumption here in Wisconsin, we moved into the rectory, which is tiny, uh, for uh, three kids and my mother living with us as well, for all six of us and soon to be seven. Uh, so we were looking at houses. One of the houses that we looked at was an Amish house. And as soon as the guy found out that, uh, that my mother was Amish, he was like, oh, he immediately began to question if he could do business with me, if he could sell his house to me. So uh, once we became Orthodox, living in an Amish community would have been very difficult to get anything done. Um, <clears throat> ironically though, uh, I am in, a, in the middle of a very large Amish and Mennonite community uh, as a priest. 
Dan Lou in Wisconsin. Wow. Um, Full circle. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, so a lot of them do know that uh, I, I used to be Amish. I went to a barn raising and uh, I took my power drill to a barn raising and ended up using my hammer a lot. Um, my arm was very sore for the next couple of days. Um, so they know that I used to be Amish. I spoke German to them and they still speak to me. So that's a good sign. Uh, so I'm hoping to, to, you know, to make a, uh, to build a road into the Amish community more. But that's going to take time. So maybe by the time I'm retired, I will have two or three Amish converts if I'm lucky. Uh, and that will hopefully steamroll from there. Um, but yes, so the, 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 the worship and the theology is what really drove us to, because of their cultural influences on their theology, and that's what drove us kind of out of the community, if you will, and into a more orthodox community. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know, Father, Father Herman Clark, um, thank you so much uh, for offering your time, sharing <laughs> your story. Um, on behalf of uh, St. Andrew's uh, Melancholy Orthodox Mission and all the faithful, um, we offer our sincere gratitude to you. We offer our prayers. I know um, both Father Herman and uh, Herman Achen and his Chimar are expecting uh, a wonderful bundle of joy uh, due within just uh, two weeks, I think. Um, so we, 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 we offer our sincere prayers for you, Father, and, and Kochima, that it's an uneventful um, few weeks. Uh, we pray for, for, for a very safe delivery. Um, for all of us who are gathered together, just as we, I mentioned last week, as you saw on social media, and there's two books that we're encouraging people to get a hold of, to read. Uh, one is Becoming Orthodox by Father Peter Gilquist, uh, which you heard Father uh, Herman mention um, just, a, just a, a, a moment ago. And the other book is uh, one of our elder brothers, uh, Father Herman, uh, Father Andrew Stephen Damick, um, Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy. It's a great book um, for all of us just to have as a resource book. Um, next week, God willing, on Friday, May 22nd, same time, same place, uh, we have a wonderful and unique privilege of having Father Seraphim Majmadar. He's a convert from Hinduism to Orthodoxy, um, meaning he is Indian. He's from North India. His family are immigrants from India. Um, he, was, he was born and raised in California. Um, his life experiences drove him to ask whether or not there was a God. And if so, was he one of the Hindu gods or something else? Uh, while searching for answers, he found truth in the Orthodox Church. Later, Father Seraphim had the unique blessing and privilege to be ordained to the Holy Priesthood at the very church that the Lord God himself resurrected from, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Um, so we are really excited to continue to hear the stories of converts joining the Holy Orthodox Church. I invite all of you to be part of that. Please um, sign up if you haven't. We're going to try to change up the Zoom links just as a matter of security. Um, and um, so you can just sign up at the link if you haven't already. Uh, thank each and every one of you. Thank you, Father Herman, once again. We wish you, your family, um, the very best, and may God continue to strengthen you as you minister to your flock at Holy Assumption. Um, and for all of you who are gathered here, uh, once again, if you don't have a spiritual home, we pray and hope at St. Andrews, you make ours your spiritual home. So please, if you have any questions about the Holy Orthodox faith, by all means, please reach out to us um, and we can get back to you. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, and you can log on to our website. Someone will definitely get back to you uh, within at least 24 hours. So once again, uh, thank you all. Uh, may the Lord God bless each and every one of you. Please join us. And most of all, please pray for our wonderful and amazing uh, community. I'm blessed to be their priest, and it's a joy uh, for us to welcome you home at St. Andrews once this pandemic is over. With the blessing of Father Herman, let us close with a benediction. May the blessings and mercies of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ be upon each and every one of our beloved children, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. God bless you and keep you in his loving care. Christ is risen. Indeed he is risen. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you all. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Father. Good night. Good night, everyone.
Good night.